I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome. I'm Amal Andraus. I'm the dean of the school. And I'm really delighted to have a fantastic group of speakers um, today to uh, think about, not only think, but also uh, act on the question of cities and climate change. Um, this uh, conversation is part of an ongoing series of, of discussions we've had and continue to have at the school here on resiliency, I'm looking at climate change from various disciplines, climate change as discourse, climate change as uh, kind of opening up new forms of engagement. And yesterday, I just uh, wanted to mention we had a fantastic and inspiring and kind of scary uh, uh, slightly scary uh, book launch with Kim Stanley Robinson, and he, you know, for those of you who don't know him, he's a uh, he's an amazing science fiction uh, writer, um, also a Jamesonian who uh, wrote the Mars trilogy and is very committed to the environment and kind of you know writing as a way to advocate for uh, uh, for um, new ways to engage with those issues. Uh, and, and, you know, the cover is, is, is really striking because it's basically a New York as Venice. Uh, New York after 50 feet of water have rised. And, uh, and he describes this kind of new life that takes place in uh, 2040 uh, of people, you know, quite localized, trying to kind of rebuild um, different forms of institutions and uh, and uh, as he said, it was a kind of uh, love letter to New York, to New York as a city, uh, as a city whose kind of beauty and infrastructure and, and, and history allows it to kind of find a way to be reborn. Um, but as he explains, uh, you know, science fiction isn't just about projecting into the future in a kind of very, very serious way and enlisting the imagination to kind of visualize and, 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 and try to, to, to kind of uh, understand what, what, what the future might hold, but it's also always a reflection on the present uh, and what are the, the ways in which we're organizing ourselves now uh, uh, and, and what can we do and, and, and how can we already start the conversation of, uh, of you know, climate change is here, uh, what are we doing about it? And so I'm very um, excited to uh, to introduce briefly Michael Kimmerman, who uh, I hope you all know is the architecture critic at the New York Times and certainly has set uh, a very strong, very distinctive and very important tone uh, for that kind of column, which is to really think about people, think about cities and, and to think about how we bring back um, um, kind of architecture, urbanism, planning to, to really engage with the important issues that f cities uh, are facing today. And, and he's started to really kind of uh, write about cities and climate change and is teaching about it um, this semester. We're really happy to have him uh, um, in a seminar that brings together uh, all of the disciplines here at the school. And for those of you who know me, this is one of the main projects is to kind of you know, think across scales and, and, and break the silos and certainly climate change. Uh, creates that renewed uh, uh, urgency. So um, please join me uh, in welcoming Michael, who will kind of introduce and, and moderate uh, the uh, conversation today. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Amal. Um, I should say it's a pleasure to be back here. I taught this morning, and... Um, uh, just across the hall, and uh, as Amal said, the, the really wonderful thing about the uh, classes, it's, for me, is it's bringing together people from the Earth Institute as well as people from uh, GSAP, and, um, and really any conversation, I think, about cities and about uh, climate change um, has to engage uh, people across a wide spectrum who are interested in the things that are inextricably bound up with um, both urban affairs and the ways in which climate affects them. And those are uh, things like uh, social equity uh, and economic development, uh, infrastructure, um, 
uh, as well as things like creating green spaces and um, fair and, and diverse housing and so forth. Um, and one of the interesting things I think that is, uh, I mean, I take it for granted that here in this audience, we, we know the large uh, globalizing trends. Um, the, this is the first urban century in, in human history. That rapid urbanization goes hand in hand with the effects of climate change on rural areas. And so mass migrations uh, from rural areas to cities, putting pressure on so many different cities, especially in the global south. And those uh, pressures um, are not exactly new. And I think the, one of the important things about climate change is not that it, it is only um, about uh, islands in the South Pacific, which are now being uh, drowned by rising seas, but it is something that is uh, affecting virtually every city uh, uh, on the planet. And this connection between climate and its, its various manifestations, climate change and its various manifestations, and urbanization and the problems of cities, their economic and social uh, problems and opportunities, that connection is really critical. I um, have begun a series for the Times, the second part of which actually just came out a few hours ago on uh, the Pearl River Delta cities. The first part of which was about Mexico City, and I chose it because um, Mexico City is an inland city a mile up. It's not a coastal city, um, but it's, it was for me a good way of saying even cities that are not uh, Miami um, are affected by climate change uh, in the sense that you have evidence of rising temperatures, more severe storms, periods of drought, um, and that these kinds of effects uh, can act as a tipping point, the spark in the tinder really, for, for cities where you already have existing problems, uh, social problems, problems of informality and um, in, infrastructural problems, all of which are bound up together. To see climate change as integrated into this, these issues is, is really key because the solutions to climate change, the, the ways we need to address it, have to also take into account all of these other challenges and opportunities. The, they, they, I think climate change needs to be seen as not just a thing in the future, but an absolutely present and critical issue now, but also as an opportunity, a way of addressing these various problems. And then making clear to people that climate change is not something that exists in some faraway place and that is an isolated issue, but that is an accelerator of existing problems and therefore needs to be dealt with just like all the things we see as the urgent issues in our major cities today. I'm, I'm thrilled that we're talking about this, uh, the cities we are talking about today and that we have the people we do um, to focus on them. Adam Freed is the now principal at Bloomberg Associates and was a former deputy director under uh, Mayor Bloomberg in the um, Office of Sustainability. And uh, Adam teaches here, I believe, as well. There you are. Um, and uh, I can testify from his coming to uh, my class very generously. Uh, he's, he's really fantastic on exactly this question of the integration of climate issues with uh, other urban issues. Jeffrey Heber is the deputy mayor and chief resilience officer in the city of New Orleans, which um, I believe had some incident a few years ago, um, which I'm sure he'll talk about. And, I, and I'm guessing that issues of equity, economic redevelopment, um, and so forth are, uh, are inseparable from, uh, as well as governance and the failures of governance and preparedness. Uh, Kate Orff, um, who's the founder of SCAPE and is an associate professor and director of urban design uh, here, um, is also the person who brought me to teach her in, in this course, and I'm uh, with them all, and I'm very uh, grateful for that. And um, Kate has been involved, among other things, with the rebuild by design um, uh, uh, projects that were following uh, Hurricane Sandy here in New York. Um, Rodrigo Rosa is a visiting research 
um, scholar here at Columbia and uh, a legislative consultant in um, uh, the Federal Senate in Brazil. And you're gonna talk about Rio, a city of um, unbelievable fascination and complexity where climate is one of many, I'm sure, uh, again, integrated issues of development and, um, and, and equity. And uh, Wei Ping Wu is the professor and, and director of urban planning program here at Columbia. And, um, and I'm very grateful to her for talking me through uh, the China piece that I wrote. And I'm sure is the absolutely ideal person to talk about um, this with us today. So without further ado, um, who's first up to bat? Great, uh, Jeffrey Hebert, thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks, Dean, for the, for the invitation. It's, it's very nice to be in my second home of New York. I was an undergraduate on the other end of Broadway. Uh, and this is my sister's alma mater. Uh, and when I have the free time to um, uh, get out of my office, I'm an adjunct uh, lecturer at Tulane University School of Architecture. So this brings me back to a place that I enjoy and not sitting in my office today, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm going to, to really get to Michael's uh, points, I'm, my presentation will go through um, really where we started at Hurricane Katrina and how we've sort of rebuilt the city since then and sort of pivoted towards uh, the future of the city, not looking back at Hurricane Katrina exclusively, but looking forward 50 to 100 years ahead at what we will face in New Orleans and how we're trying to prepare for it uh, through many uh, sets of uh, interventions. So as Michael mentioned, there was this uh, small event called Hurricane Katrina that hit the city in August 2005, uh, the costliest disaster uh, in U.S. history. 1,800 people died. 80% of uh, the city of New Orleans uh, was, was basically destroyed. Um, it had lasting effects uh, on all systems in New Orleans from infrastructure, uh, including buildings, uh, and, and protection uh, all the way down to the social systems of the city and, and, and we knew uh, that the city had to be rebuilt uh, much more strong uh, than it was in the past. So as many of you uh, know and, and some of you probably were involved in, we went through about a decade of planning uh, of what the city should be uh, for the future uh, and it had many, uh, this is documented, uh, many fits and starts uh, but really picking up in about 2007 uh, with the Unified New Orleans Plan, uh, our master plan in 2010, uh, the update to our hazard mitigation plan uh, right uh, at the end of 2010, which finally took into account uh, the semblances of what we understood about climate change and sea level rise. Uh, then the state's coastal master plan, uh, which came out in 2012, which introduced the multiple lines of defense strategy starting at the coast uh, what we call coast to curb, and then coming into the city and how you deal with urban water management there. Um, then really thinking about, uh, in about 2012, thinking about, all right, what are the social issues, what are the, uh, the economic issues that we need to really address as we're trying to build a city for the future um, that, that are part and parcel of thinking about infrastructure and, and the physical side. Uh, so a prosperity NOLA strategy came out in 2013, which is about economic opportunity. Um, in between that, we uh, put together the Greater New Orleans Urban Water Plan, uh, which was when we started to understand how we should better prepare the city to deal with urban water management. So uh, not just pumping, but how do you deal with nature-based solutions uh, to solve some of the problems that we had in the past, but also looking at uh, precipitation uh, that we uh, are tracking for the future and how do we begin to reshape our urban environment to deal with those conditions that we knew were coming our way. Uh, our NOLA for Life initiative, which came right after that, which was dealing with uh, urban violence, uh, which many cities uh, across the world that actually are also on the front lines of climate change also have violence issues. Uh, and there are some political conversations about that and what's going on in Syria and other places. Uh, and, then, and then finally, uh, in 2015, Wrapping all that up uh, through uh, the initiative that we're part of uh, through 100 Resilient Cities and the Rockefeller Foundation, really pulling all those pieces together, pivoting to the future and looking at uh, uh, projections 50 and 100 years out around climate change, but also uh, our social systems uh, and, and producing our resilient strategy, uh, which actually we uh, released um, to coincide with the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And we did that intentionally 
so as to move away from just thinking about, all right, we have to rebuild from Hurricane Katrina, but actually moving forward and thinking about how do we have to build a city for the future. So one of the things I just wanted to talk about uh, very briefly is, is how we really made that pivot uh, to go from the past, which is for New Orleanians, it was all about what happened at Hurricane Katrina and the post-Katrina condition. And, and we felt that um, the time was ripe to pivot from just thinking about that one incident to thinking about all the things that could happen to us in the future. So we went through um, a, a strategy process uh, with stakeholders and you'll notice that we had about 350 stakeholders involved in this and about 1,000 at the end of the day because we had been through uh, 10 years, a decade of planning involving tens of thousands of people. Uh, and what this was meant to do is really pull all those pieces together put it into a strategy that looked at all of the systems in a comprehensive way, and then move forward as, as a plan uh, for the future. And what that allowed us to do is think uh, back to all of the things that we've been able to accomplish. So as I, as I am here today, 87% uh, of the population is back. About 90% of the city uh, looks either as it did before Katrina or better than it did before Katrina. There clearly is still uh, a huge uh, amount of work left to do, but that the city from a post-Katrina recovery perspective was doing quite well. But as we pivot to the future and think about what's coming our way, it was time to really understand the conditions of sea level rise uh, and, and how climate change is exacerbating conditions that were already present. Um, so the first thing is to realize that New Orleans is a coastal city. People in New Orleans seem to not think about it that way, but it is. We have this a giant thing that we call a lake here uh, that is our northern boundary the city uh, as you can see the developed areas here um, we call it a lake but it is an estuary of the Gulf of Mexico so as uh, sea level rises in the Gulf of Mexico sea level rises in Lake Pontchartrain um, and is a huge existential threat for the city of New Orleans in addition to um, this is uh, rapidly this is land that is rapidly uh, going away we have the highest level uh, of relative sea level rise in the world. And so what's going on here, where you're already having the, the first traces of um, climate migration in the United States uh, from these low-lying areas up to the, the cities uh, that are a little bit further to the north, has a huge impact on what happens to the city of New Orleans. So our delta system, uh, which is connected to uh, both the Mississippi River and uh, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and thinking about what happens outside of the city and how it impacts the city uh, is where we sort of pivot. So our uh, resilience strategy uh, was really divided into three categories. The first was adapt to thrive in that in order for us to survive uh, for the future, we have to be a city that embraces our changing environment. Um, we have to advocate for uh, coastal protection restoration, which happens outside of the city. Uh, but has a huge impact on the protection of the city. We have to invest in comprehensive and innovative urban water management inside the city. Uh, we have to incentivize property owners to invest in risk reduction on their own property. We have to create a culture of environmental awareness at every stage of life, particularly beginning with children. Uh, and we have to commit to mitigating our climate impact. The second piece uh, was connect to opportunity. Uh, and in order for us to be a thriving city of the future, we have to be an equitable city. Uh, so we have to invest in financial stability for households because one of the things that we learned after Katrina and one of the things you see around the world uh, is the most vulnerable people of the world are the people who are most impacted by climate change. Uh, and in many instances, they are the ones with the least amount of resources to adapt. Uh, the second is to lower barriers to workforce partic participation, continuing to promote equitable public health outcomes, continuing to build social cohesion, which is uh, from the Katrina uh, standpoint, um, what we saw is the communities that came back more quickly were the communities that had a great deal of social cohesion. Um, and expanding access to safe and affordable housing, which is something that I think around the world uh, cities are dealing with. And the final thing is when you're uh, in a, um, uh, I will say this relatively uh, old city for US standards, a, a city that's 300 years old, some of our systems are completely outdated. Uh, some of our processes are outdated. And, and in order for us to move forward, we have to be more dynamic uh, to prepare for the future. Um, so redesigning our regional transit system, promoting sustainability as a growth strategy. This is uh, a, a huge sort of leap for us as an oil and gas community. Um, improving the redundancy and reliability of our energy infrastructure, which is, um, like a lot of places, very fragile to climate change. Uh, 
um, integrating resilience-driven decision-making across public agencies, meaning um, the themes that I'm talking about in this, uh, in this condition, how do we start to integrate those themes and that thinking across city government agencies so that it's not just the Office of Resilience and Sustainability talking about this and trying to align plans, but that is a part of the planning of the Department of Public Works. It's a part of planning of parks and parkways. It's planning that is integrated in each department, so the thinking is not just coming from above from the mayor, but that it is a part of the everyday thinking uh, of each of the line departments. Um, integrating, uh, uh, I'm sorry, investing in pre-disaster planning for post-disaster recovery, which I think many of us have learned around the world uh, is, is much more important uh, than the work that happens afterwards uh, when a disaster occurs, although in the U.S. Um, is not something that the U.S. government invests in, uh, and, which is a huge problem. Uh, and then developing the preparedness of businesses and neighborhoods, because what we also found after Katrina, and, and you see this after Sandy as well, um, is the, the more robust and prepared a business is, um, particularly markets uh, and other things that, uh, uh, that uh, people rely on, uh, that impacts the ability for a neighborhood to come back more quickly. If there are services in the neighborhood, people can come back more quickly. So climate, uh, our climate is changing. Um, without global action, the number of days New Orleans experiences temperatures above 95 degrees Fahrenheit will rapidly increase. This is something that we can get into more detail about. Sea level rise, as I discussed before, uh, because we also face coastal subsidence. Uh, South Louisiana is facing the highest rate of sea level, relative sea level rise in the world. And, this is a graphic that we use um, to try to explain to people um, what this means if you're an average height person, which I don't think I'm average height, but this is a little bit beyond my height, uh, what 2100 ground level is based on uh, the projected rates of subsidence uh, and what you see uh, as sea level uh, and how close we're getting to uh, our levee system at, at, at uh, uh, what happens at 2100 um, and where you see we are today. So yes, there is some uh, likelihood of protection, uh, and we've invested very heavily in our protection system, um, but the likelihood of uh, future uh, failure, um, and I don't mean this in a structural way, I mean just because of uh, the impact of a storm surge on what already happens with sea level rise, uh, the ability of that infrastructure that has already been built to maintain the level of preparedness that uh, a city like New Orleans depends on is not what you see uh, in the Netherlands and other places uh, that really have a more robust approach, a ro more robust national approach uh, to infrastructure funding uh, to protect uh, assets. So this is what that looks like. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers invested uh, $14 billion uh, in the hurricane risk reduction system around the city. Uh, we have the largest st storm surge barrier in the world. This is one of the largest floodgates uh, in the world to protect the city. But as I said before, uh, this was built, frankly, on uh, science that was uh, already a, a little bit uh, more conservative than it, than it needed to be at the time. And when we add in uh, the issues related to um, what we see as, uh, as uh, the rising seas, uh, the sea level rise projections for New Orleans, uh, and what we know we can model on tropical storms and, and hurricanes and the ability of storm surge to impact that, it's something that makes us think about have we really prepared for the future and is there another way that we need to adapt to live uh, in this environment. This is just a picture of the surge barrier. And, and I like to use this picture because one of the things that it demonstrates is um, after a huge disaster in the United States, uh, there's always funding and thinking about large infrastructure projects. But I love to show this picture because we, we did build the largest storm surge barrier in the world. Um, but what we really are trying to invest in, which we think has an even greater, greater impact when you put the two together, are the nature-based solutions, which of course are eroding over time and disappearing because of sea level rise, as well as the gray infrastructure solution. In tandem, they can work very well together, but if you have one without the other, the risk uh, profile is just that much higher. So as we have invested in this, we're starting to think about how to better invest in this system, um, which, is, which is costly, uh, but is a part of our uh, $50 billion uh, coastal master plan to really start to rebuild the natural protection system uh, as a part of the overall protection system uh, of the city. So as I mentioned before, this is the multiple lines of defense approach. You start with barrier islands, 
You have land bridges, all these are naturally occurring. Uh, natural ridges, uh, foundations of highways and other things that can protect uh, communities. You have the floodgates, and then you get into the urban water infrastructure uh, where the city needs to learn how to live with the amount of precipitation that we have today, the amount of precipitation uh, that is projected for the future, and our ability to adapt to an environment that we sort of um, placed a system over the natural system. It's, ta it's now time to sort of let the natural system come back and be a sponge uh, for that with which we have frankly paved over over the last 300 years. When doing that, we really have to think about designing projects for multiple benefits, uh, as Michael mentioned before. So um, yes, we want to reduce risk of flooding and subsidence, but we also want to use many of those projects, particularly in the urban area, for neighborhood revitalization and economic development, improved health and quality of life, uh, and uh, environmental education and workforce development, so that we're, we're putting all the pieces together to have a comprehensive lens to look through uh, as we develop uh, our projects. Community education and engagement is, is extremely important, uh, particularly in New Orleans where for the past 50 years when we really started uh, focusing almost exclusively um, on hard engineering, um, we're having to change the mindset of folks uh, so that they understand that um, in order for us to live in this city in the future, we can't just think about it as everything is protected by a wall. We have to think about what we need to do on our own property, how we need to change our environment to live more cohesively with uh, what we're seeing happening. So what that means is things are going to look different than they did in the past. Uh, water will be visible, whereas before water was just pushed out. Um, and we have to do that uh, in order to remain the city that we always want to be. Tying it to workforce development, so the jobs of producing the future city should go to those people who are underemployed and undertrained. Uh, and we are right now uh, in our first class uh, of a training cohort for folks who are unemployed or underemployed to enter the workforce, the green economy and the water economy so that the people who need the jobs the most are the people who are building uh, the future city. Uh, we have to, of course, take into account uh, our flood zones, uh, and we know that's going to get worse with what we see in precipitation, and how do we then retrofit the city to deal with that. So I'll leave just a few examples. Um, this is uh, one of our largest projects that we're working on today, which is a 25-acre site in a neighborhood that, frankly, used to be swamp until about 1930. Um, and we're reusing that land as well as all the other uh, public sites in that area, as well as medians and streets, to begin to retain water uh, to retain that future precipitation. And frankly, in the past two years, we've seen that future precipitation already. We're already beating what, the, uh, what, we, what we've already been told we should see in 10 years, we're already seeing over the past two years. Um, then looking at our medians and how we can then absorb water in our medians, uh, so as to uh, pull back what we already know is happening and, and how we need to completely re-engineer uh, the city to adapt from a natural systems perspective. Um, I will just quickly say that New Orleans pumps uh, more than any other place in the United States and only second to the Netherlands in the world. Um, those pumps are our largest driver of energy consumption in the city and so by reducing the load on the pumping stations we're also reducing our carbon footprint which is a part of our overall uh, climate strategy. So all these things are sort of wrapped together. And then the, I'll leave this, um, my final slide, is in all of this and all of the things that we've, we've thought about that we're projecting for the future, um, that we've learned from Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, and other things around the world, yet we still must be prepared for the unexpected. This is uh, February of this year, just a couple months ago, where uh, an a, a EF3 tornado touched down in the eastern half of New Orleans. That has never happened before. And so even though we are, we are using projections that we are prepared for, the modelers will tell you this is called a tail of something that is at the very end of modeling that could happen once or twice, but it is something that is happening and you're seeing more tails, particularly in the US and other places in the world than we've ever seen before. So even as we think about the things that uh, climate change and sea level rise and we're preparing for those things, we're having these freak weather events happen that we're not even necessarily prepared for. So we should be prepared and continue to be prepared to adapt to anything, is what I will say, uh, because we just don't know what's happening uh, out there for sure. Um, so finally, thanks for inviting me, um, and I look forward to the, to the panel discussion later.
Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, well, Michael said uh, invited Jeffrey to bat. I'm not sure if I'll be able to bat. I still try to understand the rules of baseball yet, but <laughs> I'll try to kick some ball here, <laughs> soccer ball, which is, uh, and, and of course, bring some uh, perspective of uh, the reality we have in Rio and how the climate change is affecting us and what role we can play in terms of uh, cities. Uh, this actually, I would start, uh, we've been talking about why cities, like cities have been gaining uh, more and more uh, an increasing role in a world scenario. Uh, issues that used to be uh, exclusive of nation states as climate change, as immigration, the refugee situation, security. It's increasing becoming uh, an issue for mayors around the world and uh, the communities. Uh, part of that is because, of course, the, we are becoming more urban, right? Uh, North America, Europe already uh, are uh, largely urban. Uh, Latin America was the first developing region in the world to become urban. It's gonna be the most uh, urbanized in a few years. And of course, Asia and Africa catching up. And the cities can be uh, places when, of course, we can be healthier, richer, more educated, more equal and happier. But if we don't plan it well, if we don't consider things uh, for the future, also can be places of violence, of poverty, exclusion, and vulnerability. And uh, of course, in a developing world, you have to, uh, as Michael said, uh, understand the, the situation, the, the circumstances, and uh, of the developing level, that we, the stage that we are. And uh, that's what I'm going to show a little bit. Uh, it, this is a... Um, an expression of uh, the, the economic power of cities. Uh, and they are, uh, some of the cities are m m more important than of course the, the countries. Uh, uh, that shows, in the, the, if we, this is a, a graphic from The Economist. Uh, the world, the top 100 economies in the world, if we can combine in this exercise uh, with the countries, companies, and cities, would have 34 uh, cities uh, among the top 100 economies. Uh, if, if the G20 had uh, seriously to take into consideration, of course, this is, a, this is an, uh, an exercise here, it would have to bring on the table the mayor of Tokyo, mayor of New York, and Los Angeles, uh, and before some of the, the presidents of some of the countries. But, and uh, that's bec uh, that's, uh, cities are places of um, um, concentration of wealth, and also of, of population. Uh, uh, many of the, the, the people in the world uh, gather in the large cities. Uh, the C40 uh, Climate uh, Leadership Group, which the Rio was uh, the chair in the past years following Mayor Bloomberg, uh, the, on, the only 100 uh, largest in cities in the world concentrate 25% of the GDP and, and 600 million of people. If this would be a country, it would be the third largest country in the world. But of course, the global governance uh, design is not yet prepared to understand uh, the relevance of mayors, of, of local leaders, and also to design policies adequate for the urban scenario. This is the city of Manaus. Uh, uh, this is a, was a refugee crisis in Brazil. Uh, uh, it's not an exclusive problem of uh, the Middle East or Europe. Uh, we also are facing this. There is a lot of uh, uh, immigration from refugees and other reasons uh, from developing countries to developing countries. We have to issue 4,000 um, uh, refugee visas for these ha Haitian people. And of course, these people come and they pressure the, 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 the urban systems. And in Brazil, for example, uh, uh, health care is free and universal. You cannot deny health care for, for a refugee or an, Im or an immigrant. Um, and uh, if it, Germany had received a million of people of refugees in, in 2015, as the International Organization of Immigration says, that means that Berlin actually uh, received 10,000 refugees alone. So this is, we have to understand the issue in terms of how it's affecting the, the functioning of cities, uh, especially in the developing world. Uh, we can see by Lebanon, for example, which is, uh, has uh, 4 million people and is dealing with uh, over a million refugees from the, the Syria crisis. Uh, Brazil is doing some work on this. We are uh, among the, the top countries that give actually uh, Syrian uh, refugee visas, uh, just uh, a little ahead of the United States. And um, 
and the International Organization of Immigration expects that climate change, as Michael said, is aggravating the situation. Uh, we had 21 million people displaced by disasters since uh, 2008, which is uh, a likelihood of 60% uh, more than it was four, four decades ago. And of course, that uh, uh, brings, uh, aggravates also some concerns. Uh, a terrorist attacking in Russia raises the concern here in New York City and uh, gets uh, everyone uh, uh, concerned by it. This is a, a graphic that shows how the, the refugee uh, crisis is ag aggravating. This is in Germany. Uh, the, the number of asylums, asylum asylum applications in Germany has have gone up uh, since the last years. The same here in Brazil, uh, uh, more than uh, 20 times as used to be. And uh, citizens may have uh, gradually been empowered, despite this, uh, still a lack of uh, uh, in enforcement. Uh, Rio has a um, a very long tradition on, on, sust on sustainable and climate negotiations. As you remember, the, the first uh, United Nations conference uh, that co uh, understood the problem as a, as a problem for, for society was in, in Rio in 1992. We haven't had much uh, progress in the following years uh, in, the, in Kyoto and Copenhagen. But of course, uh, uh, Brazil played actually a, a strong role uh, uh, articulating uh, the BRICS, which is, is, a, is a group that is actually a very, quite unique uh, idea of, of a, a block. Of course, they are not territorially connected and uh, unite uh, countries as Brazil, India, South Africa, and Russia, and China. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, very similar, but uh, in, in the climate uh, negotiations, they, they somewhat found uh, a common ground and, and uh, have been articulating these past years uh, their, their, their positions, we, which uh, it's a good sign how this thing is becoming global. But of course, we need to strengthen this, uh, what, what we call the multi-dimensional geopolitics, right? Uh, it's not only about uh, uh, the nations, uh, mayors uh, have to be brought on the table. Um, Benjamin Barber, m many of you have, have heard, uh, he, he defends that mayors should rule the world. Uh, of course, he, he makes an exaggeration around that. Uh, but uh, he says that because, of course, mayors are problem solvers. There's, like Bloomberg like to say, there's no uh, Republican or Democratic way to collect the trash. Uh, and they understand uh, that uh, they have to do what it, what it works. And of course, uh, their response is being what the nations should work on, which is cooperating, right? And, and I think the, the organizations as C40 should, um, sh are an example of how they are, had, have been cooperating, especially nowadays with the, in this uh, new era and with the fight against populism and, and demagogues, of course, from left to right, uh, xenophobia and, uh, and the leadership of mayors, of local leaders, it's very critical. And, uh, and also uh, other uh, uh, manifestations of that, for, of, for example, the mayor of Paris uh, uh, strengthened the, strengthens the, the agenda of the women leadership and was recently here in Colombia uh, uh, in, a, in an event talking about women leadership. We have um, a very short deadline. Uh, this uh, recent report from C40 uh, says basically we need to reduce the, our uh, emiss emissions per capita from five to three point, under three points per capita by 2030. Otherwise, we're not gonna be able to, to keep the, the temperature rise un under 1.5 degrees which will avoid the, the most, most uh, drastic effects of climate change. And, and if all of the cities, over 100,000 people, could reduce the, uh, take actions, we would do f uh, half of the work that needs to be done. Of course, the, the main work still with, uh, with the cities uh, from developed world, which... <laughs> from the developed world, which uh, have a much higher rate of emissions for, per capita, but also this is a, a work that has to be done in the developing world as well. That's why the new IPCC report has a, will have a specifically chapter uh, 
and cities uh, to understand because they understood that the the, the solution has to uh, comprehend uh, the the functioning of the urban systems. This is a favela of Rio, favela da Rocinha. 20% uh, of the population of Rio lives in slums. Uh, and also, uh, 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 this is a problem that is in New York and Rio, and uh, it's a, a sign of how the, the urban expansion has been chaotic and dysfunction. Uh, we need to think on climate policies, also considering that kind of condition. Uh, uh, still, the solutions that have been uh, mostly brought on the table uh, in, in developing countries are to use private developers to, to uh, build homes and, and real estate markets, but you need to understand the urban policies as a whole, right? Uh, in Brazil, we had a, a, a frequent um, recent uh, housing program called My Home, My Life, which gave out uh, four million homes in, in the country, but did not understand the, the issue concerning transportation or or public services as well. So if you, if you keep uh, picking those uh, part-time solutions, they're, they're gonna actually aggravate the problem in the wrong, long run. Those are the main uh, consequences of the most extreme climate effects in Rio, uh, landslides and floodings. <clears throat> this is a picture from 2010 when you had a uh, um, an extreme event, uh, Jeffrey, uh, just like you had there, and uh, it killed 60 people in, in, in Rio. Uh, it, it really uh, made uh, the, the mayor back then, I was part of the administration, uh, understand that uh, the, the climate policy could not be something that uh, was a rhetorical priority, but not an effective priority, because uh, uh, we, we saw at present how how the, clim uh, the climate has, has had been changing and how, how, how big the losses can be. So we, we basically start design the, the, the policies with uh, mitigation, of course, and uh, ad adaptation, right? What we call uh, more recently resilience. Uh, this is a mitigation, we set up with, uh, legislation of, of climate change, the first one in the city. Uh, redu uh, expecting to reduce 16% uh, of the emissions from 2009 uh, uh, for 2016. We included that in the Olympic program of the city. Uh, and of course, we start from a, a lower uh, base uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, per capita emissions. This is a comparison from the emissions uh, in Rio and, and, and other cities as well. You, as you can see, the developed world has much larger tons per capita, but that, as I said before, that doesn't mean we don't have to, to, to act or, or, do, or do things. This is the profile, but we have to understand the, the particular characteristics of, of the, em, the emissions in Rio. Uh, most of the emissions in the city are solid waste and transportation. Uh, we don't uh, emit much in, ho in housing and buildings like you do uh, because of the, the to heat. Uh, but so we have been working on this, uh, and all again, uh, the main policies were also included in the in the Olympic plan. We built uh, four BRT lines, uh, and also transferred our our waste disposal to a more modern uh, landfill and, and uh, a treat, waste treatment center, I would say, and uh, avoiding the emissions that were uh, done before. In terms of resilience. This, uh, this is the center of operation, this is a situation room. Uh, again, we took somewhat the advantage of having the Olympics to somewhat of, um, uh, 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 attract partners to develop this. This was a, a laboratory thing, was, was presented in, the, in a TED talk by the mayor a few years ago. And, um, it has, of course, high-end uh, technology to gather big data and, and try to predict. Uh, our predictions of weather there are much, much less uh, accurate than you guys have here. Uh, we yet have to yet to develop those uh, uh, weather models to, to predict the weather specifically in Rio. But this, more than the technology, this shows that um, you know how these uh, extreme events, they don't choose any time, they don't choose time to happen, right? Uh, uh, you, sometimes it goes overnight, it goes on, 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 on the weekends, on holidays, 
and uh, you really need to adjust uh, uh, the, the coordination of your departments. So uh, not because of the technology, but uh, uh, the most important thing I would say is to uh, gather all the departments together. Uh, this has over 30 departments and, uh, and taking decisions, uh, connecting in a, in a very effective way to, to, to the mayor. This was also in the Olympic plan. Usually things in Brazil uh, uh, end up being built or, or happening right before the, the event. Uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, the mayor, after the rains that we had in, in 2010, was, was clever in, in the sense that uh, he would anticipate that somewhat of a uh, situation room for, for that would happen just for the games and uh, amplify that to something that would be, uh, uh, would be lasting and, uh, to the city and, and as a legacy and de developing also some, some technology and expertise. Uh, we also uh, uh, designed a resilience plan, Jeffrey, ju just like you did in New Orleans. Uh, we're part of the, also the, the 100 Resilient Cities uh, uh, network. It was the first plan in Latin America. And of course, this is, it, was a, when it was an exercise on trying to think on, on, in the long term, uh, building scenarios in terms of vulnerability of poor communities. Uh, it's still in a very early uh, stage uh, in, and uh, try to, to predict those uh, 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 black swan scenarios, as you mentioned. Uh, we had recently um, the, the upsurge of yellow fever in Brazil, which, which was an epidemic that, uh, epidemic that was uh, gone for over five decades and is, is very lethal. It's, it's uh, one out of two die. And, uh, and uh, as Michael said, uh, the combination of, uh, of elements sometimes uh, in, in aggravates the problem. Uh, many of people today are not uh, uh, protected. They don't have the, vac the, the necessary vaccine to, the, to, to yellow fever. And uh, it is, is the same. The, the way it spreads out is mostly by the mosquito of uh, dengue, of the, the, the Zika. And, and, and if, it, if, uh, if you don't act uh, fast in, in the urban community to, to try to control the problem, that can create a, 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 a catastrophe to the city. So we have to be prepared for these uh, 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 unplanned events as well. And of course, uh, planning for the future. This is a picture of uh, Guanabara Bay and the, the recent renovated port area in Rio, uh, also one of the, the Olympic legacies. Uh, I remember when we were dis in discussions in the, in the municipal department, uh, on, on how to uh, plan the, the, this renovation, considering the elevation of sea level, and of course, the, the somewhat the, the culture and the, the engineers didn't want to, to redo their plans or, or, or incorporate new variables, but uh, uh, it was, fortunately, was uh, enough in, uh, early in the, in the project that, that we could uh, pressure and, and reinforce the, the protection against elevation of, of sea level. And, and in fact, this is not actually not going to be uh, a very high area of elevation of, of the sea level in Rio. The west part will suffer more, the, at, at least uh, according to the, the, the models we have. But still, uh, it showed uh, that how, how the, the climate uh, component is being slowly incorporated in the, in the, in the design, planning design of the city. I think that's it. I'll be here for questions and looking forward to the debate. Thank you. So I, I will move us up further north now, going from uh, New Orleans to Rio, back to New York City, uh, and really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, as Michael mentioned, I, I teach both at uh, SIPA and at SUMA. Um, so it's nice to come to a building that I'm normally not in and, and learn more about uh, what other programs are offering. Uh, I also want to particularly thank uh, Michael because the work that you do and the columns that you post on climate change uh, are critically important. You know, as important as the science and making sure we're taking a data-driven approach and understanding our risk, the storytelling is absolutely critical to make people understand what that risk means, to make it relevant to people, and to really catalyze action. Uh, and the work that you've done and colleagues at the New York Times uh, is really second to none. Uh, I also want to note that as excited as I am and as positive I am about the role of cities and the importance of cities, as Rodrigo noted and as you saw from the, the first talk, uh, the innovative things the cities are doing, 
I think this is the century of cities. I think cities are the demonstrated leaders on so many issues. That does not mean that our federal and state governments can abdicate their responsibility to take action. Um, so while we're doing amazing things, the risk does loom for federal and state preemption to cut off many of the programs and the funding streams that have enabled New Orleans to recover and, and thrive so well that enabled New York to bounce back uh, after what we faced here with Hurricane Sandy. Um, so stay positive, stay excited, um, but stay engaged. Uh, so I want to talk quickly uh, about the work that has been going on in New York. Um, and I do also apologize, I'm going to have to leave a little early from the discussion afterwards. Uh, it's not because I'm running out because I'm scared of your questions. Uh, I have a flight that I need to catch, so my apologies for that. Um, what was interesting about New York, and, and we've talked about climate and climate change as an opportunity, all of our climate work in New York and our sustainability actions had absolutely nothing to do with climate change. It started with this graph that projected that by the year 2030, New York was going to increase by a million people. And our mayor at the time, Michael Bloomberg, said, well, what does that mean? What do we have to do to accommodate that growth? Because we think growth is good, growth is necessary for the city. We want to accommodate those people, but we want to do so in a way that builds our economy and doesn't impinge on and actually enhances the quality of life for our existing New Yorkers. And we knew that meant that we needed to upgrade our infrastructure. Uh, for anyone who, who recognizes this picture because you've been stuck in traffic on the BQE, uh, our infrastructure today in New York, or in 2007 when we started on this question, was already outdated and couldn't handle the traffic, the flow, the pressures we were putting on it already, forgetting about a million more people, forgetting about climate change. So we said we have a million more people, we need to upgrade, update our aging and outdated infrastructure, and we're in a global economy. You actually don't need to live in New York anymore to work on Wall Street. You don't need to have a Madison Avenue address to have an advertising firm. You have to want to be here. So how do we make a city that attracts the people, that attracts the talent, that attracts then the companies and their tax revenues to be here? And you, you've seen this now as Nashville is a growing economy, not because they have a history in finance, a history in tech, but because people want to live in that city. So they're one of the fastest growing job centers and population centers in the country. So we thought about, well, what do we do to make the city a place people want to be? And we knew that climate change was a clear and present danger today when we were doing this. This is pre-Sandy, but we knew we had heat waves every year. We had torrential downpours. We had the August 8, 2007 rain burst that shut down the subway system. So we knew that we faced real and significant climate risks without climate change. We knew climate change was going to get worse. How do we take that into account as we're thinking about our city's future? And then we also, and this has been added in more recent years much more explicitly, any of these questions bring up the issues of equality and bring up the issues of social inclusion. So how do you make these long-term infrastructure investments, how do you think about the future of the city and do so in a way that raises you know, everyone up in the city and makes more equality and, and addresses some of the social and economic inequalities that are systemic in our cities and in our societies? So all of that came out in a series of plans. I, I recognized and appreciated your slide. You know, it started in 2007 with the release of Plan YC, uh, which was the city's first comprehensive plan looking at the future of city from the 1965 kind of master plans for New York, which had five or six tomes, each this big, about that wide, that I think were opened once and then put on a shelf. We wanted to have an actionable document. We knew that we did not have all the answers. In fact, we weren't even asking all the questions in 2007. So we worked with the city council to enact a law that requires the city to update its sustainability plan once every four years. Every new mayor has to ask these questions. What does the next 20 years look like for the city? It has to incorporate climate change. Uh, we have to do an annual progress report that publicly releases how we're doing on this. You have to have uh, updated climate change projections once every five years. Uh, and we have to have a greenhouse gas inventory every year by law. So we wanted to institutionalize this long-term planning so it wasn't another 40 years until you had someone coming along and begin to ask these questions. So we had the Plan YC update in 2011, post-Sandy. We expanded that and took what was one chapter on climate resilience into over a 200-page plan about how are we going to look at not just strengthening the city and reacting to Sandy, but how are we going to think about the long litany and list of risks that we face. Then, and this is what our hope was, the next administration came, and because by law the city is required to update its sustainability plan, you had the evolution into 1NYC. That was looking at what is that long-term future for the city and how do we want to address not just climate change, but a lot of the threats we face. I'm going to focus on what's in there on climate. 
So we've talked about climate adaptation. We've talked a lot about the risks we face. As we also, on the other side of that coin, have climate mitigation. New York is the largest city uh, in the world to commit to an 80% reduction in its GHG emissions by 2050. Uh, this is the waterfall chart that just gives you a sense of where those reductions have to come from. Uh, unlike Rio, the largest share for us is buildings. Over two-thirds of our emissions come from buildings, 1.1 million buildings in the city. Uh, you know, the, the benefit of being in a small, dense environment, we have small apartments. We have shared walls, so we share the heat from our apartments next to us. We can walk places. It means we have a lower carbon footprint when it comes to transportation, but we need to clean up our building stock. Much of this is existing buildings. We need to clean up our power supply. Uh, we need to look at our transportation network, but we're already pretty efficient. The per capita foot carbon footprint of a New Yorker is one-third the national average because of a lot of these issues. And then we get a little bit out of solid waste. Talked about buildings, 1.1 million buildings in the city. We really wanted to follow the data, and under the uh, Mayor Bloomberg, we looked at the information and found that just 2% of our building stock, those are all the buildings that are under, uh, sorry, over 50,000 square feet, were responsible for half of the energy use in buildings. So we had the choice of going after 20,000 buildings, and there are large buildings, usually owned by uh, large companies, very sophisticated management structures, and saying, we need to work with you to lower your carbon emissions or we could go after the other million building owners, many of them small distributed, and try to work with them. We wanted to go after the 2%, and so we enacted the Greener Greater Buildings Plan, which required a whole series of lighting upgrades, uh, audits, um, retro commissioning processes, benchmarking, so that publicly disclosed energy and water use. And these large buildings, an estimate that's gonna be 5% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions. The single largest action the city could take at that time to reduce our carbon emissions, just going after 2% of our building stock. And by the way, it would save those building owners $750 million a year in reduced energy costs, and we estimate it would create about 18,000 jobs in the city, looking at that opportunity side. We also knew we needed to clean up our energy supply system. Uh, the state is doing a, a large effort now, and, and Governor Cuomo deserves a lot of credit for the New York Rev, a program that's looking at energy systems and distribution and transmission throughout the state. We also know there's an opportunity in the city on distributed generation, and things like Hurricane Sandy, things like Katrina have taught us, relying on big systems mean that they were more likely to fail, and when they do fail, you'll have catastrophic results. I live in Lower Manhattan. I was that dark part of the uh, previous slide when we lost power. Thankfully, I live on the third floor, I could walk up and down, but all of our buildings, if you lose power and you're more than six stories tall, you lose water. Uh, and that is a bigger impact than power when you have two children and a wife and uh, no water for five days. Um, so looking at distributed systems, looking at utility scale solar, and how can that help the city be more resilient as we meet our carbon reduction goal? And looking at microgrids. This is actually a pilot now that's happening in Brooklyn. 30 houses and brownstones are coming together they're installing solar on different uh, rooftops. They're actually sharing it within a network so you can buy it from your neighbor and have a distributed generation in a microgrid. You know, what are those innovations that we can look at that the city can help enable, but it's really allowing private action and, and individuals to take more control of their destiny, help us meet those long-term goals, and enhance the resilience of the city. Transportation is a major issue uh, in the city. This was the traditional response. You need to build more subways. You need to go underground. Very expensive. Uh, if you look at the history of the Second Avenue subway, very long period of time to make it happen. We are doing that. That is important for the city. But it's also looking about how you use your assets that already exist much better. 25% of the city is the public right-of-way. It's streets and sidewalks. It's not well utilized when it's fully dedicated to cars. How do we do things like introducing BRT and taking ideas from Curitiba and other cities in Latin America that had long been pioneering new ways of better utilizing transportation? We brought that to New York. We launched the select bus service, saw a 20% increase in ridership and a 20% increase in bus speeds. And you can now see these throughout the city and continuing to be expanded. We launched the city bike system. Now, I used to always joke that New York City has long had the largest and oldest bike share program in the world in the 1980s, we had about 20,000 bikes stolen a year. Um, so we've had a long practice of sharing with our neighbors. Um, but we launched City Bike and the Bike Share Program. And now in 2016, two thirds of all rides on a Bike Share Program in the US were in New York, over 13 million rides on the City Bike system, something that people fought against, 
thought didn't make sense, and now is wildly successful, and I think anyone who tries to get rid of it will face large challenges. And, and we needed to look at the infrastructure to go before this, expanding bike lanes, making sure the infrastructure is there for bike parking, but wildly successful at, at giving people more sustainable transportation options. And as I said, designing the cities not for cars, not for modes of transportation, but for people. When I first moved to New York, I, and I still uh, avoided Times Square, because it looked like this. And who would have thought that you could turn it literally overnight into a pedestrian plaza and bring that to neighborhoods throughout the city, having a dramatic impact not only on the streets, but increasing rents, increasing retail value and the revenue that stores are having, improving air quality, and really creating hubs within communities. So now there's a public plaza program where neighborhoods are volunteering and asking and applying to have plazas brought to their communities. As you're doing all of that, as you're looking at your infrastructure, public health, I think, if you're trying to get people engaged in climate change, if you're trying to get them to think about it, much more than greenhouse gas emissions, much more than polar bears, talking about the impact on public health is the way to motivate people. Uh, and even in New York today, 8% of all deaths in the city can be attributed to poor air quality. And again, we followed the data and we understood that half of the air pollution in the city came from local sources. And we found that just 10,000 buildings, 1% of our building stock was responsible for more PM 2.5 than all cars and trucks combined. And we knew where those buildings were. They weren't moving around. They were registered and staying in New York. And it was because they were burning heavy heating oil, which is how they're heating themselves, which ends up in these plumes of smoke. And it turns out that in New York City, we regulate boilers in the city. Every three years, you need to renew your permit. So we said, you're stranded in the city. We control you. We regulate you every three years and you're the biggest source of local air pollution. So this is what our air quality looked like in the winter of 2008. All these black areas are uh, our air pollution areas. And what was really interesting by putting street level air quality monitors out in the street and measuring where emissions were, this is not an EJ issue. This is not something that's limited to low income neighborhoods. At that time, Mayor Bloomberg, who may not be considered a lower income person, uh, lived on the Upper East Side worked in Lower Manhattan. You saw the Upper West Side, the Upper East Side. Some of the wealthiest areas in the city had some of the worst air quality. They had no idea. It helped us build a much better political base to say this is a critical issue to focus on. This is about the South Bronx. This is about asthma rates. But there is a large amount of people who need to come together to help address this issue because this is where a lot of the sources of air pollution were coming. So we enacted legislation. We phased out heavy heating oil. Uh, we said you can't burn it anymore in the city. You have to transition over the long term to much cleaner fuels. Uh, there's a great stories behind the shenanigans and machinations that had to happen with Albany and the city council uh, to make this happen. But in just three years, we went from this to that. We phased out heavy heating oil in 6,000 buildings. 65% drop in PM 2.5 from these buildings. 70% reduction in overall sulfur emissions throughout the city. New York City now has the cleanest air quality it's had in over 50 years. We can only go back 50 years because that's when the record started, um, just from one policy. Uh, and this is the second biggest public health initiative during Mayor Bloomberg's term after the smoking ban indoors. So huge effort, and it's helping us reduce our climate change emissions. We never, ever talked about that. Brings us to climate risks as well. Every inch of rain we get in the city, it's a billion gallons of stormwater. We need to capture, treat, store, try to uh, ameliorate before it goes into our water bodies so we don't pollute our waterways. That is a really big challenge. You can do it by building bigger treatment plants. You can do it by increasing the size of your pipes. You can do it by building underground storage tanks, which have no value other than when it rains. We think that there's a better way. Distributed generation, I'm sure Kate's going to talk a lot about this, uh, with green infrastructure and stormwater management where we're working now to capture the first inch of rain on 10% of the land area in the city. And as I mentioned, 25% of the city is hardscaped right of way. 1.6 billion square feet of the city is rooftops. There's a lot of opportunities to better utilize that area, turning it into bioswales, that neighborhood beautification, help combat the urban heat island effect, increased property value, looking at green roofs, um, looking at uh, the green belt, the blue belt in Staten Island. So the city now has over 4,000 green infrastructure installations throughout the city that act as a distributed system to capture stormwater, 
to retain it, to hold it back so we don't have flooding events, so we can have better uh, water quality and we have a greener, lusher city. Multiple, multiple benefits. And by the way, it's cheaper than the traditional responses of gray infrastructure. More complicated to try to make sure it works as a whole system. Uh, you have to make sure that the regulators agree to it and have confidence it'll work. But the benefits are really astronomical. And that brings us then to our changing environment. Because one of our biggest challenges is we don't always know how to manage the environment we face, and we have a changing environmental baseline. So we know that we face sea level rise. We know we face climate change in the city. Uh, enormous amounts of the city are already in a 100-year floodplain. Uh, those are those blue areas. Uh, that includes JFK Airport. That includes Newark. That includes part of Wall Street. With sea level rise, that'll get even more of the city. 25% of the city will be in a 1 in 100-year floodplain. That does not mean that you have a 1 in 100 chance of a flood happening. It means that if you bought a mortgage, you have a one in three chance in the lifespan of your mortgage over 30 years that you're going to face a flood of eight to 13 feet. It's a very different way of thinking about that, I think, would get people acting differently. But there are things we can do about this. You know, man and cities have existed in floodplains and in climate risk areas forever. They're always at confluence of rivers. That's where the commerce is. You have to acknowledge your risk and you have to account for it. So there are a number of programs that are happening. Many of these predated Sandy. This is Brooklyn Bridge Park that was actually designed to accommodate flood. So you have riprap uh, so it can flood salt tolerant materials. It faced little damage from Sandy because it was designed with sea level rise and with coastal storms in mind. There are new parks that are coming in that incorporate natural infrastructure. And we took the lesson from New Orleans. And you have hardscaping. Both of those working together provide benefits and can reduce your risk. We're looking at temporary solutions. No one wants to live facing a wall. People go to waterfront areas for a reason. There is increased risk. So how do you have mobile strategies that can be deployed? And how do you face heat waves? That's something that everyone always wants to talk about water. More people die a year from heat waves globally and from heat-related impacts than any other natural hazard combined. So we're painting rooftops white. We're really looking at how do we change the DNA of our city from our source systems to our rooftops. And every facet of our built environment needs to change to incorporate and acknowledge and accommodate the risks that we face. It can be done. It can make a better city. You have to do it. You have to have the political will. And that's at the leadership first, but also from your legislative bodies. You need to put the money behind it. And in many cases, it's not building brand new infrastructure. It's adding 10% or 5%. We were building a park in Brooklyn Bridge. We needed to build it in a way that accommodated sea level rise, accommodated climate change, that may have added 5 or 10% to it. Um, and all things have to be personal. Uh, the last slide I want to end at is how I think about this and why I dedicate my life to this. It's not because it's an esoteric issue. This is my father, who was born in 1945. At that time, the mean annual temperature in New York was 53 degrees Fahrenheit. When I was born in 1976, we had already increased uh, a degree in our mean annual temperature, and New York saw three and a half inches of sea level rise. At that point, we were then seeing about two weeks' worth of days over 90 degrees. Flash forward to my son being born in 2008, we'd already increased another degree temperature. We'd seen four more inches of sea level rise in New York. When my son goes to college, uh, roughly, uh, and this always dates me when people laugh at this if they know the movie or not, um, you're going to see even more in, uh, temperature increase. We're going to be about 58 degrees, our main annual temperature in New York. That's five degrees increase from when my father was born, four degree increase from when I was born. It means we go from 18 days a year over 90 degrees to 30 degrees, a full month over 90 degrees. That means Amtrak has to slow down and speed restrictions come in. It means our power grid can melt, huge health risks, uh, and more increased mortality and mortality rates. We see infrastructure aging faster. Uh, you may have to change your, uh, your airplanes and your runways to account for changes in uh, air density. And we're going to see at that point now two feet of sea level, uh, about a foot of sea level rise from when my father was born. And when you flash forward to when my son may have a child, uh, we're seeing a dramatically different city. The mean annual temperature has gone up almost 10 degrees. We're now at 61 degrees Fahrenheit. You're seeing two months maybe uh, of days over 90 degrees. That's a dramatically different city. And you're seeing two feet of sea level rise. So for me, I don't think about this as something that's theoretically going to happen. I care about my son. I care about his family, uh, should he choose to have one. This is going to have real impacts on what the world looks like. This is a real and existential threat that we face. There are solutions to it. We need to have the will and the resources behind it to address it. So thank you for being here and uh, for inviting me.
So do we want to start with the responses? Okay, I, I'm Kate Orff, thank you so much. <laughs> I have a very brief response and, and because I'm quite interested in getting to the questions, there's so much to be learned from the sort of shared experiences. Um, I guess, you know, first of all, just this uh, a moment of sort of celebration and acknowledgement of all the successes that have um, been able to be achieved at the city scale. And I thought m some of my remarks are more along the lines of what are the, the limits of the scale of the city relative to climate change? Because I feel that, and um, you know, Adam had, had brought this up in his uh, remarks, that clearly cities are taking the lead relative to climate adaptation. It may be our only choice right at this moment because cities are obviously um, uh, large agglomerations and uh, densities of populations that have a shared future. And, and, um, and so I think that the, I, I would just say to, to break that idea down into the limits of the scale of city into two, two sort of larger buckets, one being um, the, the kind of zone of regulatory um, challenges and governance, right? And each of these kind of large projects described there has to be an alignment of city, state, and federal, at least in the state side um, uh, context, an alignment of, of goals. And um, without that alignment, then the funding scenarios become incredibly difficult. Any project that goes outside a scale of any sort of a regional, uh, a sort of very localized context um, uh, requires um, a, a much sort of, uh, much more buy-in, if you will on the city uh, from a state and, and federal context. And um, the second bucket I wanted to, to um, uh, talk about is literally not only the sort of governance scale of the city, but literally the physical spatial scale of the city as a kind of a limit to addressing climate change. Because, um, tr you know, I think the the graph that you showed, Rodrigo, also of the, the list of the highest, the, the, the most intense economies going from um, United States to um, Los Angeles to ExxonMobil to Barcelona <laughs> really shows that the, these networks of, of power, the sort of um, fundamental economic and, or economy-wide reallocations and revaluing uh, of, of these systems of fossil fuel <laughs> generated mm -hmm. energy sources um, and the, the larger scale value shifts that do need to occur to address climate change, not just adaptation or mm -hmm. you know altering the physical landscape, um, are truly those that, as I would totally agree, you know require uh, pressure at a kind of a federal scale. Um, and it's these um, these two issues that I'd I'd be interested in talking more about. Thank you. Um, I'm Wei Ping Wu. Um, really enjoyed your presentations. I'm particularly uh, impressed by how much the equity angle and the social justice angle are in your considerations. I'd like to actually follow up uh, Kate's uh, remarks in the sense that I think climate change really significantly aggravates this conflict or tension between market and policy. Mm. That is, um, it really calls for far more collective action in a sense, both across scales as well as across different population segments. And the interesting part is I hear this wonderful work that New Orleans is doing in terms of multi, uh, mobilizing uh, communities to plan ahead of time. But we also know that as people become more urban, mm -hmm. the more traditional social networks and relations disappear. Mm -hmm. So we know mm -hmm. when people move from rural to urban areas, that kind of connection, that kind of self-help networks uh, uh, disappear or are reduced. But we also know there's research that has shown, for instance, in Chicago, the heat waves, yeah. that the presence of social capital yes. and networks are very significant in uh, reducing um, uh, you know, fatality as well as increasing recovery. Mm -hmm. And so as we look at all of these uh, uh, very effective strategies to overcome the inertias in the build environment, can we think about also ways in which the urban built environment is reconstructed first 
to facilitate, facilitate more interactions or to facilitate what you know, Robert Putman would call you know, the churches of the neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. Where in which you would increase more interactions and in some Northern European city designs to sort of uh, communal shared housing, especially when we were looking already mm -hmm. at uh, 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 huge increasing elements of shared mm -hmm. uh, economy and governance in cities. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was reading a little bit about the, you know, the proposed plan for the Hudson Yard in terms of the exhibition, the, the architectural space, and that kind of, you know, sort of new kinds of built environment that could really rethink and help us rethink the human interactions among each other. Not, so right now we're sort of addressing more of the human and environmental interactions. And I, I think, you know, climate change gives us that opportunity perhaps to think together in that sense is that is something that I think it's bringing further uh, elements in addition to the environmental justice mm -hmm. elements that have been in here. And I would love to hear what you have to add. So I'm, I'm really glad that, um, that uh, Wei Ping and Kate moved this conversation instantly into the two um, areas which uh, are both critical to climate change and also are, in a way, the I'm sure the problem is that you're all aware of, and those do have to do with governance and the governance on different levels because, you know, let's face it, there's a whole kind of rhetoric of the city and the mayor um, which has been developed which along with um, the, the boxes that can be ticked by mayors to prove that they have, you know, the right climate strategies, uh, um, and all of those are good, um, but um, are entirely ineffectual if you do not uh, have governance um, at a larger scale, and um, no bike lane is in itself going to solve uh, Rio's um, climate and, and other problems. And, and then this, uh, I think this uh, session, this issue that Wei Ping brings up, which is so key, and I'm glad you mentioned Eric Leinenberg's book too, this question of social resilience as being inextricable from, um, from climate resilience, because we know, uh, and several of you brought this up too, I, really everybody did, I think, in some context, that the climate is not just about building levees, it's not just about creating you know, sponge parks, it's, it does have on some fundamental level to do with creating community and to creating an environment of uh, social justice um, and environmental justice, which prepares people for the problems that um, we will have. I think one of the interesting things, you know, in the case of a country like the Netherlands, which is always held up um, for, for all the annoying reasons as, as the perfect country, <laughs> nonetheless, um, one of the interesting things about the strategy there is it is so tied to social, uh, social resilience um, as well. And this notion that somehow, you know, the, the communities have to be um, they can't just exist behind um, uh, levees. But I, but I mention it not just to remind people of, of the annoying Netherlands, but also to um, raise one other issue. I just wanted to talk to you about this a little bit. And that is, in a place like that, they, um, they complain that people have become complacent. Mm -hmm. Because if you build th this relationship between public awareness and participation and, um, and sort of uh, the gray infrastructure and other governmental sort of efforts is a, is a constant balancing act. In the Netherlands, people have come to feel that water has been taken care of. Mm -hmm. And so this question of emergency preparedness and that kind of community resilience is, is an issue. Um, so I just wanted to raise that myself as one thing. And then I was gonna, let me just plunge in with a, a direct question. Um, so in Rio, um, my impression is, and maybe this is a way of saying, can you talk about some of the countervailing um, tensions? Y you had the Olympics, which was uh, supposed to be an accelerator of um, progressive urban redevelopment and adding uh, rapid bus and so forth. Um, you had a lot of social conflict uh, that um, was around some of the Olympic construction. And my impression is that a lot of the Olympic redevelopment along uh, the waterfront and to the north um, was one thing, but there's also a, a persistent economically driven um, and class division driven 
uh, sprawl to the west in gated communities. Um, and so, correct me, a city like Rio is a really interesting case of two countervailing, strongly countervailing and sort of canceling out tendencies. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could talk to that and, and how, because it's not, you're not alone in that, mm -hmm. uh, how you deal with that kind of attention. Should I just start? Uh, well, starting from your last question, um, um, of course, Rio is in a, is a somewhat of a higher uh, level of inequality than um, New York, which is an, e an equal city for, for American standards. Uh, but uh, and I think the, the there is a lot of uh, uh, misconception and, and misunderstanding on on the developments, like uh, in the specific of the what we broadly call the Olympic investments or the recent investments in the city. Uh, almost all of the investment was done in the poor areas of Rio, uh, which it traditionally lacked of, for example, public service as transportation. So uh, all the BRT lines were done connecting the, the, the area of the sea that had a, a absent uh, public uh, uh, access to transportation. Also, there was a large expansion of healthcare. Uh, we, we went from 2% of the population covered by primary care to over 50% of the population. Uh, and built over 70 health family clinics or basically uh, healthcare units that uh, uh, focused on the most needed uh, areas of the city. But in fact, to, 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 read, to make such a um, strong uh, uh, intervention in, this, in the city's tissue, uh, there was needed uh, 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 relocations, uh, but, but to build, uh, bus corridors that would benefit the whole society. And we, we, what we have had uh, uh, now, uh, looked uh, in the past years is that uh, um, that uh, helped to reduce inequality in the city. But this is a long-term challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say uh, there is a um, so somewhat of a collective uh, learning about uh, uh, the community feeling. I think in New Orleans we were talking about this how deep-rooted deep uh, uh, culture mm -hmm. and the community engagement mm -hmm. can be valuable to the development of, of communities, uh, both in Rio, New Orleans, in New York, in, in its sense as well. And uh, we're taking advantage of, of something like that, but it's, it's a long-term challenge. Yeah, Adam. So, you know, responding to two of the previous comments and then following with that, you know, the, the role of cities and the idea of connecting to other areas, you know, two statistics with that. 70% of global emissions come from cities, mm -hmm. which is the good news. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory did a report that estimated what proportion of the carbon reductions in the U.S. needed to meet the Paris Agreement could come from cities. They estimated on a moderate scale 15% under a super aggressive scenario 35%. Mm -hmm. So cities are really important. but. They're not the whole story. In New York, how we can get to 80 by 50 and how we measure that out, on the energy side, it's fully dependent on the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standard in New York State, that projects that 50% of the energy in the state is going to come from renewable energy by 2030. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't happen, if we can't clean up our power supply, you know, we can get a lot through efficiency in buildings, and that's really important. But if they're drawing from, you know, if you're drawing a hybrid car, but it's still pulling, or an electric vehicle from a coal power plant, that's a major problem. So cities are important, but others. Talking about markets, you know, I think the two challenges we face, or big challenge we face is pricing. That nothing, there's no price on carbon, there's no price on the externalities caused by pollution. Uh, we don't price risk well. So people live in risky areas because insurance is so low. That's right. Because they can build there. Um, and our bonds are really bad. You know, you can get a 30-year bond, or a city can go out for a municipal bond to build something new in a high-risk area. Uh, and there's no downgrading or increased percentage rate that they have to repay that on. Likewise, renewable energy and some of the carbon climate mitigation strategies are viewed as riskier uh, than fossil fuel investments, even though there's greater price fluctuation in fossil fuels. So we're not pricing these things correctly. Um, maybe I'll, I'll stop there and let others answer the social cohesion. Yeah, I, I, I want to go back to the, the comment about cities and mayors. And, and I think 
um, you know, our mayor is a member of all the networks, <laughs> and we actually believe in the philosophy that, that mayors can make change. But then I think one of the things that we're beginning to think more strategically about is between cities and metros. Regions. The yeah. regions. Yeah, I totally agree. And, yeah. and um, you know, in the U.S. And, and all over the world, cities and the regions that they are in sometimes have varying political um, factions against each other, the big city versus the smaller suburbs or the smaller towns or the other areas of the region. And really, in order for us to continue to scale up what we need to do, we have to be more involved in regions. So, you know, New Orleans has a very strong mayor form of government, same as New York City and, and other cities. But the ability for us to, to go beyond the city scale and go up to the regional scale and the jurisdictions outside of cities is that much more important to make, uh, to make that change. I mean, when we look at, at New Orleans in particular, you know, sea level rise as it impacts the city of New Orleans also impacts the neighboring jurisdictions, right? That's all linked together. What's done at the coast impacts us all. So the ability to get beyond the strong leadership of the strong mayors, but get beyond that and bring our regions together is, is even more important. I was in uh, Melbourne, Australia the, two months ago, um, and they really are thinking hard about, Melbourne itself is very small, and there are, I think, 33 governments around Melbourne that make up what you would normally conceive of as the city of Melbourne. Um, I mean, it's contiguous, you don't even know you're in a different place. And so the ability there to get 33 other governments uh, around uh, the issues that the city of Melbourne itself, which is actually quite small, uh, is putting forth as strong leadership, I think is, is the next level that we have to get to um, because uh, these issues cross boundaries. This is not just uh, about the cities. And then on the national level, you know, uh, Mayor Landrieu uh, will be coming into being uh, the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and one of the things that we're thinking very hard about um, is uh, how mayors can exert political uh, muscle, and how mayors as groups can push national governments, not just in the US, but around the world, to a different place. Um, and, and that's sort of, at this point, where we have to really focus our energies, because that, that's where we are. And then the last thing I'll say on the, on the piece about uh, traditional ways of life and traditional connections, um, as, as we were talking about, Roger and I were talking about, New Orleans has a very strong culture, carnival-based culture, very much like Brazil. Uh, and those carnival or organizations um, are very deeply held, deeply uh, seated uh, connections for social cohesion in the city. However, what's happening is with um, uh, the scale of this, of course, is quite different from New York. But what's happening with affordable housing and housing affordability, where we have 57% uh, of, of the people of New Orleans who are spending almost over 50% of their income on housing, and you're seeing massive displacement as new investment comes into the city. That's starting to disrupt those traditional cultural connections. And, and that is concerning for us because that is where you get the cohesion, uh, and that's where you get the ability for people to take care of one another, which is critically important as we move into the future. So it's a connection, as you were saying, Michael, before, this is a web of connections between, in, in this particular case, culture, housing, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the outcomes of being able to be resilient, that, that it begins to become a cultural preservation issue as well. Could, could I just build on for two seconds on the, the regional point, too, because I, I, I find that to be a, an incredibly important point. And in the, in the urban design studio in the past couple of years, we've, we've done we've a series of studies on um, global cities and climate adaptation. And, but rather, we found very quickly, like when we went to Rio last year, we didn't stay in Rio. All the students were quite disappointed that they weren't uh, dancing in the, in the parades. We went out along the Rio Paraiba River, which is really the source of the drinking water, mm -hmm. frankly, for Rio, right? Mm -hmm. So you really have to look at an upstream environment. Similarly, this year, um, we're looking at both Amman, Jordan, and the Jordan River Valley. Mm -hmm. And in uh, thanks, Adam. Thank and you, Adam. Um, at Calcutta, India, you know, a, a mega city, mm -hmm. which is in, in obviously different scale, but like New Orleans, is highly interdependent upon it, a regional wetland ecosystem, mm -hmm. um, which is at the Ganges Delta. So it's funny how we, you know, even in just trying to address this topic, our entire frame of uh, defining what a city is, if you will, has has changed. <laughs> 
Yeah, you were going to well, say. Maybe just to really quickly follow up on that. There are precedents, you know, so if you look at Ches Chesapeake Bay, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. in Virginia, Maryland, mm -hmm. there's long tradition of that cross-state even yep. um, collaboration, of course, it requires political will and mm -hmm. the commitment. But, you know, it's interesting why, Michael, you were writing that article about China. You know, all Chinese cities are one big government, it doesn't necessarily align itself right. to really, uh, you know, progressive actions. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think certainly there's that in there. But I think if you look at London, uh, the greater London has been able to achieve mm -hmm. uh, many things right. mm -hmm. that are equally challenging. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think as, as you were saying this, I was thinking, uh, you're right about Melbourne. Um, in that same country, Sydney does not have the same municipal agreements. Mm -hmm. And that's a very good example of a federal government, that uh, national government, which has been reluctant, shall we say, <laughs> to deal with climate issues. So, you know, you can, you can have in certain places where that's the cohesive mm -hmm. possibility. Look, I mean, even in New York, God knows you don't have a better example of the ways in which what seem like even uh, basic, simple moves like congestion pricing, which worked in London, is not possible here because the suburban right. uh, commuters uh, don't want it and, the, and Albany doesn't want it. Um, so it's very difficult. I, I think one of the, um, the, the, one of the key things is finding strategies, finding common ground, um, and find, shaping arguments for, that may be climate driven ultimately, but uh, are, uh, serve other purposes. Um, finding common ground across those uh, political and uh, social divides is, uh, is really the way to begin to build those uh, coalitions, mm -hmm. uh, political and, and other coalitions. Um, I, I'm sorry Adam left at that moment because one of the things he talked about when he came to my class, we, we were using as a kind of example the plastic bag mm -hmm. um, uh, ban. And that which failed in New York, mm -hmm. and where it has worked in other cases, and how one could reframe this. Um, you know, it's not going to solve all of our environmental problems, but it seems like a, on a, one level a no-brainer. And that in the Chesapeake area, there was a there, there was a kind of coalition of different people around whom um, the idea of cleaning the river. Yeah became something that was a sort mm -hmm. of socially, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, here, it, it got tied up uh, in the Albany, in the governor, mayor issues, and in uh, the idea that this, uh, the money would go back to the store. So maybe there, the, the point is strategically beginning to think of um, policy mm -hmm. as something that can build those coalitions mm -hmm. on a case-by-case -case basis and a city-by-city -city basis. There isn't a kind of toolkit of interchangeable parts. Yeah, I think uh, the metropolitan challenge is like, it's a huge anywhere. Uh, in Brazil, uh, there is some specific situations after the constitution of 88. Uh, states, federal government and municipalities have the same level of, let's say, uh, as institutions, uh, three level, but there's no metropolitan coordination. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much up to the state governor to have the lead, its own leadership, and uh, and as we said before, in fact, uh, national governments have not uh, pushed this agenda forward. But of course, as uh, metropolitan areas grow, the, the the problems become more and more integrated, and uh, we really need to change that uh, that perception and, and start to think. I think uh, climate change. Uh, in the environment are, are natural issues that this, uh, this lack of governance bring, uh, brings about. I mean, they should be, but let's face it, for most people, and this is certainly true of most Americans, if they even acknowledge climate change exists, it is not high on their list of uh, demands um, for a lot of understandable reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that things that are related to climate change, whether it's, I mean, in, in China, clean air. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a, a very clear issue. Um, so one can, again, mm -hmm. target certain ideas and issues uh, without having to have buy-in from everybody that climate change is the, is the driver. To that point, um, I'll just posit this. We had a conversation 
last week or two weeks ago, I serve on the Governor's Advisory Commission for Coastal Restoration, and we're talking about the state's coastal master plan, which is regional and, and, and is built on 30 years of, of talking about coastal restoration, which really comes from the fisheries industry. And that yeah. was sort of the entree into that conversation many years ago. But in, when we're looking at funding and, and how do we talk about this, what, what came up in that meeting um, very publicly and, and a lot of discussion about is the national defense issues related to sea level rise and climate change yeah. for cities across the U.S., military installations both in the U.S. and around the world that the government controls and the fact that the uh, Defense Department was the first uh, to recognize climate change in, in, in the U.S. government. And so do we pivot to having a conversation of climate change as a national defense issue in order to raise uh, the awareness and raise the issues around it in this current environment? And it was a really serious conversation of that. How do you, how do you continue to get um, attention in this when, when the U.S. Defense Department sees it as one of their most existential threats? So it's a really interesting way of trying to weave, mm -hmm. you know, conversations uh, to, to make this relevant. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in all cases, uh, that's a, a really great example that defense and economic development. Ex yep. I mean, the reason London has been so uh, effective, of course, is because London basically is um, the British economy. Um, I, you know, I think it accounts for a third or almost 40 percent of the economy. So the massive investments right. in infrastructural development and new transit and all that sort of thing and the government is based in London too, it's, a, it's an easier argument. But it can be made in other cases as well. Where's the economy growing? Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, uh, I'll shut up, but uh, I should let you guys talk more, but one of the things that occurs to me as we're speaking is climate change is linked, as we see, to urbanization. Urbanization is linked to the uh, climate problems that have caused rural uh, failures right. and in some cases conflict that yep. causes migration. And those urban-rural uh, divisions, which are linked to climate change, are expressed in the United States as well on, in political terms. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, how do we bridge this conversation across rural-urban divides and mm -hmm. show people that somehow these are shared problems? It's complicated because the political constituencies are quite different and the perception of, of resources and division of resources, different people in red states think that blue states are taking more money mm -hmm. from, from the till, the federal till, even though it's in fact the other way around. Mm -hmm. And you know, so that, that is a really difficult mindset to change. It has to, I think, to stem from a feeling that this step, whether it's defense or some kind of yeah. economic co yeah. mm -hmm. corporate benefit, is going to help them. So. Oh, you're leaving too. No, this you. is like musical chairs. Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> thank you, Michael. If you could expand that point in your book, <laughs> I think that will be an excellent book yeah. because I, I I do feel like at least in the U.S. context that is literally the crux of the problem right now. I yeah. think the other, just to build on that point, is the other issue is around just representational governance. I mean, I think the. The, the, the borough of the Bronx is the same population as West Virginia, for example, right? right? So, so you yeah. have those, those challenges relative to the urbanization of the United States and, and, how, and how these now this inflects back and how this um, projects forward is, is a tremendous question. I do feel like um, also the concept of storytelling and narrative is critical. Um, SCAPE, our office, has also begun to work more in um, uh, places that have, are not, you know, are primarily, we who initially primarily focused on coastal flooding, but the fact is there's rivering flooding, mm -hmm. there's increased tornadoes mm -hmm. in, in many, so right. we have projects now in North Dakota where people are looking for some of the same strategies that are, you know, I think the, you know, uh, the, the key is to try to develop a series of physical interventions that themselves beget and kind of, um, trigger more social cohesion, right? So that the physical remaking of the environment works in tandem with a kind of a social project. There's risks in that, I suppose, but I, I do feel like that is part of the key relative to, you know, your, your the, the, the remark about, you know, how do, how can we see climate adaptation as a 
benefit and as a, as a way to improve. And, and so if we can somehow understand and, and, and shift the, the discussion just away from coastal flooding in the blue yeah, states, right. mm -hmm. which it is not, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> it is about increased risk in, in almost, you know, in, in, in every micro environment or every regional economy. <laughs> Um, and, and shift that discussion, and uh, that 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 will be a critical yeah. a critical shift. To build that social cohesion, we need the last thing we should be talking about is carbon, and mm -hmm. translate uh -huh. to that carbon. to the communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the message to the Bronx is different mm -hmm. to North Dakota mm -hmm. is different in the rich areas of Rio, mm -hmm. and is different in the, in the poor communities of Rio. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we still talk the same, even like us here, yeah. we are still talk in the same uh, scientific approach or which is the, the root of the problem, but we need to, to get, to build that coalition, to build better governance, we need to translate that to. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it comes out of a, a very basic economic argument yeah. as mm -hmm. well. I mean, the, 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 the argument for resilience works on all economic levels, but it's rarely made. Uh, it's made as a kind of ethical, moral, and uh, yeah. environmental issue. And that is in itself, I think, a social divider, but there's a good economic reason. Okay, to I, two things on that. I think the, the outreach and community education in the language that people speak is important, yeah. as you were saying. I mean, we're, we're using highly technical language, but being able to translate that highly technical language into what matters for people the most and, and meeting them where they are, I think, is, is important. And I think a lot of places we've started to do that. Um, and I, th I think, you know, we are in an architecture school. I think it is extremely important, I believe it's extremely important that we, we do have physical, tangible things for people to see as mm -hmm. demonstrations that can start to try to change some behavior. So we, you know, one of the first things that we did, we started a pilot program um, to build demonstration rain garden sites that had educational signage and we worked with the community groups to mm -hmm. put them together so that people could start to understand what we're talking about and understand the risk. And as those things, it's, they've been in for about four years now, now they understand it, now people are embracing it and they actually understand how it works because they can actually see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that builds the capacity for you to do more. But that was based on, sort of a very um, localized, neighborhood-based design process that led to pilots that then people could see, touch, feel, understand, see work over time that could lead you to sort of the larger scale interventions that we're doing okay. now. But, but it, this isn't a natural thing for people to just understand what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you have to be able to talk about it in a way that people can understand it. And I feel, feel very strongly about you have to do some sort of demonstration so that they can see, feel, touch, yeah, smell, proof of, uh, proof of concept. Yeah, I mean one, uh, and then maybe we open it up to some questions. But one, one, it, Kate is involved with one of the rebuild projects, but another one of the rebuild projects, which is the big U that mm -hmm. many people in this room may know about, I think is an interesting um, example of this kind of um, doing one thing and talking about another thing, essentially, mm -hmm. which is that uh, while Lower Manhattan, you know, uh, is uh, threatened and in a hypothetical world we should not have, uh, you know, our entire economic future based on the buildings that are there, they're not going to go away. So the question becomes, how do we protect that? So this idea of building a soft border uh, has been around for a while, but the, the, the project, the big U as it's called, that, that is beginning there starts, if, after all, with a little segment, mm -hmm. not so little, but pretty little, um, uh, at a place where the East River is adjacent to public housing projects, which mm -hmm. have been very underserved uh, without um, access to the river and without uh, recreation space and so forth. So the project is sold, that part of it at least, is sold as, um, it doesn't have to be sold as a climate thing, it doesn't have to be sold as an, a, a proof of concept of a, essentially a, right. a levy, but as a community benefit That's right. and equity based for a mayor coming in as well mm -hmm. who's, mm -hmm. who's running on this. That kind of strategy That's right. um, I think is you know, absolutely the only way mm -hmm. to, to build buy-in, uh, especially community buy-in. Mm -hmm. do, do we want to, do we have some questions? Sure. today of uh, cities and climate action, especially if you elect the right political leadership 
as we did in this city at, at one time, uh, almost miracles can happen. The picture of Times Square is a case in point. But what concerns me, and we've kind of danced into and out of it, if we change the word cities to intergovernmental relations and climate action, <laughs> and the regionalism thing, <laughs> which held great promise decades ago, mm -hmm. when the federal government actually promoted it, mm -hmm. graduate students studied it, and I did, and we even taught it. It's all forgotten now. People aren't interested in it as much. And then finally, big elephant in the room, based on all those executive orders that have been signed recently, is the federal government. Mm -hmm. And instead of climate action being something that everybody can embrace and kumbaya with, it becomes a political thing. And it seems one major party doesn't even believe in it. So in conclusion, I'd like to ask the panel, are you at all optimistic about intergovernmental relations and climate action? Because I'm not. I'm very optimistic about your cities and climate action, because you're demonstrating what's going on and the best is yet to come. You know, I, I remain cautiously optimistic, but to be honest, I, you know, we get a new executive order every day, two or three. We have no idea what's going on. Um, and, and I think, to be honest, in the U.S., and, and, you know, we're in networks with cities all around the country, I think we've all just decided that we need to do what we can, and we have to just react. I mean, we literally, this is not even a, a joke, um, every day, all of our cities, communications teams are reacting because there's something new every single day. This is, a, this is a completely different territory than we've ever been in before. And so you'll see, I probably have four or five emails now going around between different cities and are, you know, is your mayor gonna sign on to this thing that we have to send today? I mean, it's just a, we're in a completely different environment that, that we, I don't think we're necessarily prepared for. So I have to say I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but it remains to be seen. I mean, uh, with this administration, uh, they say one thing one day and then turn around and do something exactly opposite the next day. So I, you just don't know where you stand. This is, this is very much so shifting sand here uh, in the U.S. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we're needing leadership, right? Uh, cities have show, showed uh, action within their boundaries. Maybe it's about to now, time to the mayors now to advocate more on a national and intergovernmental level. Mm -hmm. uh, Brazil is also going to its own intergovernmental yeah. crisis as well. Yeah. And, uh, and as I said in, 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 my, in my speech, uh, uh, this is the perfect area for constructive perspectives, not destructive perspectives. You know, I, I wrote about Mexico City in this mm -hmm. series, and uh, if you talk to officials in Mexico City, they say the same sorts of things that uh, mm -hmm. representatives from Rio and, and, and New Orleans here say. We, you know, we have the following agenda we're trying to do. Um, and when I then asked, you know, started to inquire about, and what kind of support do you get from the federal government, which is in league with a lot of this, it's very similar to the United States in that you have a federal government which sort of it supports private development, sprawl, highways, uh, every single thing that thwarts uh, the efforts by that city. If you ask, you know, uh, how that works, they will tell you it doesn't work. In fact, the federal government recently uh, in Mexico City cut to zero all funding for all of these programs that, uh, including public transit period, because the mayor of Mexico City was threatening to run for president and so was challenging. So th this is not unique to the United States where there are in any case existing hurdles, legal and otherwise, for the current administration to overcome. They can't completely undo everything. But saying that it's a huge problem, which is definitely the case, is not the same as saying that the only real way to move forward is tr somehow trying to build larger alliances or find common ground. You know, one interesting case will be infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, right. The president said he's interested in doing something infrastructural, uh, and then it turns out he just wants to fund his friends, you know, tax breaks for highways. But think about it, you have a project like Gateway, mm -hmm. 
a critical yeah. tunnels under the Hudson River, um, wh which are bound up with all the issues we're talking about here, uh, which are also which is also critical to the development of the West Side. And who was his what, his closest advisor on infrastructure? One of the developers runs Vornado who has massive investments mm -hmm. around Penn Station on the west side of Manhattan. So before we decide that this is a mm -hmm. completely dysfunctional situation in which there's no hope of, you know, and we've learned this, maybe some things need to be played out over a period of time. I'm not saying, I'm not sounding too optimistic, but I'm just saying, mm -hmm. I personally am not convinced that this is an impossible situation, even at the moment, mm -hmm. if we can find these, uh, Occasional just places. Quick note, not that it's perfect, but it's way ahead of the others. Portland and that metro area. Mm, yeah. And more people to take a look at it, not the doctors or they yeah. but no people aren't looking at it. Yeah. You. One more question? Somebody out there? Yeah. Where is that hand? Yeah. Okay, so just quickly, um, I thought one very important example missing from this conversation, which I hugely uh, appreciate and uh, respect for the, the information and analysis she presented, is Paris. And I'm not talking about the Paris Treaty, I'm talking about Paris planning. Yeah. And I am a little biased because I have a book contract <laughs> to write about regional planning in Paris, but um, the French have had, of course, state-led capitalist planning and highly dirigiste, and, and they didn't even have a mayor of Paris until 69, not since the revolution. So it really was the state with kind of what you could call a, I don't know, a, a, a colonial governor, the préfet. Mm -hmm who took care of everything, and while nobody was looking around 1965, they managed to come up with a regional plan for the entire region mm -hmm. that included, was really very well coordinated, all things considered. I mean, there were many mistakes, and it happened to coincide with the nadir of architectural design, but that was a piece of it. But, you know, they created La Défense, is a big, hot, so they didn't, you know, destroy the center of Paris, they created the new towns, they created, but most importantly, transportation, which is what they are excellent at. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out one other quick thing about Paris, in that back uh, when the French environmental movement became very uh, big around seven, in the early 70s, uh, the environmental poster uh, was of the fifth arrondissement one of the most densely populated urban areas in, in, I won't say the world, but certainly in the Western world. And at the same time in the United States, our poster, which was a Sierra Club poster, was, you know, depicted a human being, I'll say, no gender, uh, sort of contemplating nature in a state of solitude. <laughs> So I think that goes a long way towards explaining um, a certain uh, kind of, well, we were talking about rural and urban, but anyway, a, a certain view of nature, environment. Mm -hmm. I would add to that the recent um, change to uh, uh, the, the governance structure um, of, of Paris with the metropolitan government. Mm -hmm. coming into play, which, which right. adds another layer of, of that right. sort of more regional thinking in the Ile-de-France and, and right. that entire area. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but one of the things about that change is that the, I, I would uh, I respectfully just disagree a little bit with what you said, because of course what actually happened when you had the, the, the growth of uh, Paris was that you had the peripherique which created a center and pushed mm -hmm. all of the banlieue, the, the suburbs on the outskirts, to uh, in, not all, but many of them impoverished, and you had mm -hmm. a, hub, a hub and spoke a system of transportation so that they couldn't, um, their only jobs were coming into central Paris, and so there are, there are fundamental structural problems in Paris that is, have always revolved around the centrality mm -hmm. of, of Paris. Of Paris. Yeah. And uh, this new metropolitan Paris and the notion uh, 
of creating a transit system which will um, go connect some of the out, outer lines of the suburbs to each other, not just to the center. This is, in a way, remedial work, mm -hmm. which I think um, is along the lines of what we're talking about, how to create a larger city and a more equitable city as well, mm -hmm. I, would, I would hope. So. I, can, I can only agree. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I hope that was enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.